Well, brethren, this month, June 2022, the Queen Elizabeth is celebrating her Platinum Jubilee. Now, this is a very unique occasion because there will be no point in history and in any future that any monarch uh, on the British throne or otherwise would most likely celebrate the uh, 70 years of successful rule. And therefore, I thought to make some uh, break from analyzing the book of Jeremiah in order to be reminded myself and to remind the rest of you also about the origin of the British monarchy. Many people believe that with the death of, possible death of Queen Elizabeth, the uh, Britain will not be monarchy anymore. And uh, I think you know the answer to that, <laughs> to that question. No, Britain will have to be a monarchy because uh, King David has a special covenant with the Eternal in the Bible that there will be always a physical descendant on that throne until the one to whom the throne belongs, and that is Jesus Christ the Messiah, until he comes and until he sits on that very throne. So therefore, we know that the monarchy will have to exist. And not only that, but we also know that it was exactly the prophet Jeremiah, he was the one used by the Eternal to transplant the throne of David from the Middle East, from the Promised Land, into the lost house of Israel, that is, into the British Isles. Having in mind all of these important things, as well as the fact that it was exactly Prophet Jeremiah used by God, and one of those uh, three men in the Bible who was predestined for his mission, even before his birth, we I just wanted to remind you of the importance and the origin of this throne. You see, uh, there is, uh, there is interesting, there are interesting biblical facts in relation to that throne. Dr. Steele has recently uh, even uh, made a program from Ireland on the Stone of Destiny. Well, you see, the scriptures are full of references to stones, both literal and symbolic. So, as I was analyzing here my library uh, potential, and as I was uh, looking and sorting through the books that I have in the Library of Hope of Israel, I came across an interesting little book, uh, Stone of Scone or Coronation Seat, or uh, basically the that's the uh, that's the illustration on the cover on the cover page. But the very title of the book is Jacob's Pillar Stone of Destiny, and this book was booklet rather was published in 1977. Uh, it was uh, written by Raymond Capt, which is very interesting that you know uh, in in 2017 it was 21st printing of that little booklet. Very interesting indeed, and uh, that booklet summarizes more or less all the things that we know from the Bible about the uh, throne of David. And as I, as I looked through that booklet, as I perused it, I thought, well, this would be an interesting thing to use it to present all these necessary facts to us, brethren, so because uh, that we can be reminded of the origin of British throne and its significance. So again, uh, this wonderful booklet again is uh, basically showing to the rest of the world, more or less, uh, the uh, facts that we, as the followers of Christ, that we should know as the as a Philadelphia remnant, because the Philadelphia Church of God, uh, the one in uh, Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, is indeed the only church group, is the only church era, if you wish, that which is given the key of David. And having been given the key of David means that that group of believers, they do know the identity of the house of David today, and they also are aware of the covenant that God uh, has with David, and they also do know and do understand that uh, the throne of David is indeed uh, ruling over a part of Israel today, and that that throne is now being kept by the various physical monarchs, including Queen Elizabeth, of course, until the very owner of that throne, David, uh, David's son as well, David's descendant, Jesus Christ, will come to occupy it. And so therefore, you see, the stone, uh, the stone that Dr. Thiel was, was referring to in one of his programs, you see, so there are various stones, literal and symbolic, and what such stone in the, indeed is the one in Ireland, or the one that uh, came into Ireland because of the prophet Jeremiah, who is in our focus these days. 
Jacob was, our patriarch Jacob, was the one who rested his head when he dreamed of the heavenly ladder. He rested his head on that stone. And this stone has not received the attention perhaps it deserves from various Bible believers. Now, however, the stone that Jacob later anointed with oil and declared to be God's house, Beth El in Hebrew, it did not remain lost in the wilderness of Luz, where he happened to be at that point. It continued to play an important part in the destiny of Jacob's descendants. Now, in the past, such suggestions, you know, that uh, the stone has been lost or that, um, uh, you know, such suggestions that the stone is not even lost, but it is part of the even modern history of uh, Jacob's descendants was, of course, were d dismissed and they were regarded as fascinating legends and traditions, but there are indeed pertinent historical writings and visible evidence worthy of consideration, uh, which Dr. Bob Thiel pointed out in his program. Now, in Jacob's stone, uh, is Jacob's stone the house of God? Does it exist today? Does it bear witness to God's amazing plan for our planet? Oh, yes, indeed, brethren, and we need to know that. That's the stone of Beth El that I mentioned in Genesis chapter 28. If you have your Bible, and I, I do wish that you do use your, always your Bible to follow along, and I always encourage you to mark your Bible and uh, underline important verses because it does tremendously help the Bible study. Keep in mind always, brethren, uh, the book itself, the book of the Bible, a copy of the Bible, it's a book. It's a book. The book itself is not sacred. What is sacred is what is written in the book. So, uh, Genesis 28, verse 10. And Jacob went out from Bathsheba and went toward Haran, or Haran, and he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascended and descended on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father and the God of Isaac, the land, whereupon you lie to these, uh, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed, so to you and to your descendants, indeed. And then continuing then all the way to verse 22. And your seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And that's exactly how the house of Israel, after being exiled from the promised land, did spread. They first went to the west, populated Western Europe, populated the British Isles, then they went to the east, then they went up to the north, then they went down to the south. The, um, the last point which they populated was the south, in fact, South Africa. And in D... And in your, in your, in your seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with you and will keep you in all places where you go and will bring you again into this land for I will not leave you until I have done that which I have spoken to you of. And Jacob awoke out of his sleep and he said, surely the Lord is in this place and I knew it not. And he was afraid and he said, how dreadful is this place. This is none other but the house of God and this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Beth El, but the name of that city was called Luz at the first. And Jacob vowed a vow saying, if God will be with me, and will keep me in this way, and I go, and will have me, and give he will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come, so that I come again to my father's house in peace. Then shall the Lord be my God, and this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house, and of all that thou shalt give me, I'll surely give the tenth unto you. Well, the tenth, of course, the uh, the, the, the tithing principle, as you see, was well in place before Moses. Keep in mind that Jacob's grandfather, Abraham, was the first one who was giving tithe to Melchizedek. And who was Melchizedek? Well, according to the book of Hebrews, none else but Jesus Christ, indeed. So the uh, principle of tithing is not some Old Testament principle. It's not part of the Mosaic law that Moses instituted so that it will be a burden to the people. No, it's a blessing to the people. In the book of Malachi, the very last book of the Old Testament, the Malachi does remind people and tells them to obey all the things, all the things in the law. And he specifically, God through Malachi, points out the tithing. He points out tithing and he says to Malachi, 
uh, through Malachi to humankind, he says that it will be a test, that humans can test God. And that the only test that they could put upon God is to be faithful in tithing. And then if you're faithful in tithing, eternal says, then you'll see whether I will not open the heavenly gates and bless you tremendously. So here is a test for all of you indeed, and uh, keep that test in mind. Otherwise, uh, as God says through Malachi, people are robbing him and stealing from him. So we see that the scripture deals chiefly with that which took place between Jacob and the Lord, as Jacob was making a journey from Beersheba to Padan Aran. Now I'll mention of a certain sunset and stones, mind you in plural, for pillows seems incidental perhaps, but suddenly one of those stones is brought into great distinction. The fact which brought that special stone into such prominence may be quickly read, you know, for the Bible account of them is very short, and their true symbolic significance and importance is generally overlooked. You see, in uh, ancient Israel, just like in those ancient times, the veneration of sacred pillars was common in those days. But nowhere in the scripture do we find an inanimate object being given such a glorious eminence or divinely declared purpose, as that is the case with this pillow stone upon which Jacob rested his head on that certain night because it was anointed later with the oil, you know. Because Jacob was so spiritually impressed that to memorialize the occasion and the place, he blessed the stone on which he rested and he sanctified it by anointing it with oil and gave it the name Bethel, God's house. And although Jacob gave the name Bethel to that place or locality where the stone was set up, he emphatically declared, the stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. Now, 22 years passed and Jacob was directed by the Lord to return to Bethel. And in the interim, he had been blessed, you know, not only with great riches, but by a knowledge that at that place, Bethel was his God. And on his return, he had a vision. And again, the Eternal spoke to him saying, I'm the God of Bethel. You find that in Genesis 31, verse 13. I'm the God of Bethel. And thus the Lord associated himself, not only with the place of the vision, but also with the Bethel stone, implying that he himself inspired both the choice of this stone and its name. So after returning to Bethel, please go to Genesis 35, after returning to Bethel, Jacob erected an altar of stones, and again, God appeared unto Jacob and blessed him, saying, Genesis 35, verse 11, Your name is Jacob. Your name shall not be called anymore Jacob, but Israel, which has different meaning, prevailed with, with, with God. That's what I think is the primary meaning, but it can also mean, according to some commentaries, it can mean sons ruling with God. So your name will be Israel. And God said unto him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply a nation, and a company of nations shall come out, shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. Now we know there is one nation under God, well known to all the world, that became the most powerful nation in the world after the Second World War, that's the United States of America, and a company or a commonwealth of nation, indeed, of nations is indeed now in place as well, and is being ruled by David's throne, uh, on which currently the Queen Elizabeth is has been sitting for 70 long years. We know that, and uh, those who do not know that have, serial, have a series of my lectures on the House of Israel and their identity, so they can hear it there. Now, while the Bible account does not state explicitly that Jacob took, took that Bethel stone with him, when he left Bethel, it is, you know, hard to imagine that he would have simply left a monument with such a remarkable associations to lie in the fields and be lost. <laughs> Rather, it is most likely that this special stone would be kept and venerated down through the ages. Now, there is biblical evidence to show that the Bethel stone was indeed the inheritance of Joseph. It was committed to the care of the house of Joseph. We find that in Genesis 49 and in verse 24. When he was dying, the dying Jacob summoned all of his sons and uh, uh, he gave to each one of his sons the prophecies about what his, their descendants will be doing and what they'll be accomplishing in the last days, in our very days. And it, uh, this is 49 verse 24, he gave to Joseph, uh, he gave to Joseph this uh, instruction, from thence, from you is the shepherd, the stone of 
Israel. Now, prior to this prophecy to Jacob, to Joseph, that is, he first um, passed on his birthright, Jacob, dying Jacob, passed on his birthright to the Joseph's sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And then as he was passing his birthright, he stopped in the midst of that prophetic utterance and he used the like parenthetical expression, this from thence is the shepherd the stone of Israel. Thence, in this in, uh, instance, is an adverb used as a noun, and it is equivalent in value to that place, or the place to which it refers. So the phrase from thence means out of there, out from thither, or out of that place. Now the place from whence, present form of the old word thence, <laughs> oh, how interesting is English language sometimes to us who whose uh, native tongues are of different origin. So anyway, the place from the winds, uh, the stone came, which was Bet El, was part of the inheritance which fell to the house of Joseph, indeed, when the land of Canaan was divided among the children of Jacob. And this suggests that not only Bet El, the city or place, but also Bet El, the pillar rock, was given to the birthright family. And today's birthright family, indeed, has already inherited his birthright, uh, Joseph and Manasseh, uh, Joseph's son Ephraim and Manasseh, because out of Ephraim came English people and out of Manasseh came the American people and they became the ruling nations in the 20th century. They've already been blessed so tremendously as no other nation under the earth was. And they fulfilled that material part that God promised to Jacob, that his son, his descendants will be incredibly wealthy materially and that they will be ruling the world for a while. So since those promises have been fulfilled, now we are seeing something different. We are seeing now God withholding those prom withholding the blessings that He has given because He is no longer obligated to give blessings. He has only fulfilled that promise, unconditional promise, and now He is taking His blessings away. And now we see the decline, steady decline of the Anglo-Saxon world, and soon. According to the prophecies in the Old Testament, which have been confirmed in the New Testament by the words of Jesus Christ, soon we are going to see a total destruction of the Anglo-Saxon nations. And then approximately 215 years later, at the time of the Exodus, Jacob's descendants, or a large part of them, left Egypt under the leadership of Moses with all their possessions and much spoil besides. Now Jacob's anointed stone, stone must have gone out of Egypt with them, and thereafter it was accompanying them through their long 40-year trek through the wilderness. Now the history and movement of Israel's wanderings in the desert wilderness is a, indeed, it is a fascinating story, because the Eternal it continually provided food for the Israelites during those 40 years, and we have on two occasions recorded in the scriptures that uh, God supernaturally provided them with water. The first occasion was mentioned when the Israelites were encamped at Rephidim, where there was no water for the people to drink. And without, without previously selecting one special rock, which is interesting, the Lord said unto Moses in Exodus 17 verse 6, Behold, I'll stand before thee, there upon the rock of Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock and there shall come water out of it, and the people may drink. Now the phrase there in Horeb, or Horeb, however you want to pronounce it, points out at the place where the rock was at that time. If the Lord, when he spoke of the rock, had used the demonstrative form and said, that rock, then we should know that he was designing which one, or a certain one, not yet selected, but the fact that he said, the rock, indicated to us, that he was speaking of a rock with which the Israelites were already familiar. It was undoubtedly the Beth El Pillar rock, the shepherd, the stone of Israel, which had come, which had been indeed committed to the keeping of the house of Joseph. And the second uh, instance when the people were without water was at Kadesh, a city in the border of Edom. And we find in Numbers chapter 20 verse 4 and 5, that, uh, you know, the border of Edom, so the area was belonging to the descendants of Esau. And at that place, the people of Israel were very bitter against Moses and Aaron and said to them, uh, Numbers 4 and 5, uh, chapter 20, 
Why have you brought up the congregation of the Lord into this wilderness that we and our cattle should die, should die there? And wherefore have you made us to come out, up out of Egypt to bring us into this evil place? It is no place of seed or of figs or of wine or of pomegranates, neither is there any water to drink. And again, the Eternal appeared to Moses saying, verse 8, Take the rod and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron, thy brother, and speak you to the rock before their eyes. And it shall give forth his water, and you shall bring forth to them water out of the rock, so that you shall give the congregation and their beasts drink. Now in both you see cases where the Lord provided water from the rock, there is not the slightest indication that there was any selection or indication of a preference for any certain rock in the vicinity of Kadesh, or that one was already, or that one, that the rock was not already chosen and in their midst, that it was, so it was a rock that was already chosen in their midst, that they were all familiar with it, you see. And, uh, it is clear that at the very first mention of water for the people from this rock, all that was necessary as a preparatory measure was for the eternal to say to Moses, speak to the rock. And when the people were commanded to gather before the rock, they clearly understood which rock it was, so that in all the great company no explanations were necessary, and therefore it must have been among them before this event and well known to them. Now, I'm sure that you're all familiar, or at least uh, understand, brethren, that Jacob's stone, or rock, was a type of Jesus Christ. It was a type of Jesus Christ who would bring forth living waters, welling up into eternal life. Now, for proof, we can go to back to the place called Beth-El, the house of God, and there we find that Jacob, after setting up the rock for a pillar, also anointed it with oil, which is in sacred symbols, typical of the Holy Spirit. Now, according to sacred history, this Bethel stone is the only single stone that has ever been anointed, and it, you know, it was making it preeminently, it was the anointed one. You see, when Christ, the great prototype, came, and when he was anointed with the Holy Spirit, he was preeminent among men, and he was indeed the anointed one, the Messiah. Also concerning this rock, which accompanied Israel, the Eternal could say to Moses, like in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we will see uh, that it was the same rock because the Lord said to Moses, speak to the rock. But on the other hand, Israel also could say concerning that divine presence which went with them, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 4, with, when, Jesus, when uh, the Apostle Paul, led by Jesus Christ, of course, uh, reveals to us, they could say, let us sing unto the rock of our salvation. That's also David's psalm. But the uh, in, uh, it's not First Corinthians, but it's David's psalm. However, in First Corinthians, we, we read that, uh, that the uh, sons of Israel did drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that flow, followed them, and that rock was Christ. That rock was Christ, First Corinthians 10, verse 4. So... Uh, Israelites in ancient times could sing, let us into the rock of our salvation. And uh, also it speaks about that rock, that it was the one that followed them all, with, all throughout their journey in the wilderness. Now Jacob also called the stone the shepherd of Israel. And there is also a divine one unto whom Israel prayed. You remember, he watches over Israel. Israel was praying, give ear O shepherd of Israel. And later when this same shepherd was manifested in the flesh, <coughs> he himself said, as we know in the New Testament, I am the good shepherd. And also his apostles spoke of him as the great shepherd and the chief shepherd. Now since with God names are always characteristic, we would expect that this stone of Israel would be with Israel in all their wanderings. And hence, this shepherd, on a quotation mark, though it be only a stone, as any other shepherd would do, must go with his flock. And further, 
that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Israel's divine shepherd rock was smitten, for it is written in the Bible, smite the shepherd. So too, Israel's literal, literal shepherd rock was smitten. You see, the Lord knew that he must be smitten for the sins of the people, and that the type and prototype might agree, he basically gave command, smite the rock. So in view of God's miraculous intervention at their deliverance from Egypt, it should not be difficult to believe that the children of Israel were supplied with water from that literal rock which went with them. It was their shepherd rock. Otherwise, how could Moses, in asking permission for the Israelites to pass through the land of Edom, give assurance to the king of Edom, the following assurance in Numbers 20, verse 17, We will not pass through the fields or through the vineyards, neither will we drink of the water of the wells. We will go by the king's highway. We will not turn to the right nor to the left until we have passed thy borders. How could he give such an assurance if... There was no rock that provided water with them. You see, the land that they had to travel through was several hundred miles or kilometers in length and would have taken certainly a considerable length of time. However, Israel could afford to make this proposition for both their shepherds' the rocks were with them, the literal and the spiritual. <laughs> and they knew that he who had hitherto furnished them with food and water, would continue to supply them until the end of their journey. Otherwise, Moses would never have been made, he would never have made such a promise anyway. And yes, indeed, true, there was a conditional promise made in which there was a promise to pay for any of the water of Edom, which Israel might use. Now, this was made chiefly on account of the cattle, which, they, you know, the cattle, they might not always be in control, were passing by, you know, by the cool and tempting water pool, so the cattle might just, you know, uh, use some water anyway. That's to be expected anyway. So during the heat of the day, this might provide a difficult task for the drivers, and this was this proviso. You know, if it happens that we, uh, that we possibly use your wells or your water <laughs> supply, we're going to pay for it. Well, brethren, I just wanted to, with this uh, few comments on this pillar stone, to. Uh, remind you of the origin of British monarchy and remind you that its long history goes all the way back to ancient Israel. We shall continue to uh, analyze this. We need this stone. Of, the stone of Israel is very important, so we need to continue to analyze it. And we also need to be reminded of the uh, book of Ezekiel, which we already analyzed in the past. And we have a series on the, a series on the book of Ezekiel. There is Ezekiel's riddle. And we'll see that in our next uh, installment, as well as we need to be reminded of the Zerah, the second son, the twin brother of Phares, the second son of Judah. He was the prince of the Scarlet Thread. And after that, in our last installment, we are going to uh, be reminded of the three overturns of this of this uh, uh, of this throne, uh, whose foundation in a sense was this <laughs> interesting Jacob's pillar and then with that we'll be reminded that this year we have celebrated the uh, platinum jubilee of Queen Elizabeth the longest ruling British monarch but there is a great significance of the throne on which she sits which she occupies and even though uh, certainly her rule her reign would be a interesting historical period of time in which he successfully ruled such a huge commonwealth of nations. And there are people who do expect that with her abdication, her abdication or her death, the uh, dominance of British Empire is coming to an end. I think they're, tr they're right. Yes, it's coming indeed to an end because that's the prophecy. Not exactly per, per se with her. It could have been only any other monarch, but we see in our days in which we live that this is indeed the last days. So therefore, we can see in the future that the monarchy will struggle perhaps to survive. But it will survive. It will survive because the one to whom it belongs has to occupy the existent, existing throne. So, uh, again... The history of British throne, the history of British monarchy, is very interesting because, again, it goes back 
far, 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 far away into the past. And if you wonder what will be its future, well, its future is that the return Messiah who returns, to whom it belongs, will occupy it and will sit on it forever.